Securitization. Before we look at how securitization works, we have to familiarize ourselves with the balance sheet of a bank. For this example, we will use Nationwide, which is technically a building society, not a bank. Nationwide is the largest building society in the UK with assets of approximately £200 billion. So let's have a look at Nationwide's balance sheet for the year ended April 2012. Nationwide has assets of approximately £200 billion. This is compared to Lloyds Bank, which has assets of approximately £1 trillion for the same period. So Lloyds Bank is about five times bigger than Nationwide. And for reference, the GDP of the UK is approximately £1.5 trillion. The total liabilities of Nationwide are also around £200 billion. Thus, the balance sheet balances. Total liabilities, that is the amounts owed to third parties, amounts to £190 billion. The remainder is the reserves, in effect the shareholders' funds, if Nationwide had any shareholders, but as a building society, Nationwide is in effect owned by its members or depositors. This amount represents the ability of Nationwide to absorb any losses that it might make in the future. So now we've looked at the financial structure of the bank, let us look at how the commercial bank trades. Arthur has just been paid. Arthur deposits his money with the bank. As the money is transferred to the bank, the amount will appear on the bank's balance sheet as a liability. Have a look at Nationwide's balance sheet. On the liabilities side, the biggest number on the balance sheet is shares. This represents the deposits that have been made. In effect, Arthur is lending his money to the bank. Nationwide call the, calls this numbers shares because it is a mutual building society owned by its depositors. So Arthur has deposited his money in the bank. But while he may think in terms of deposit, he has in fact lent his money to the bank. What does the bank do with that money? It lends it to Ben, who uses the money to buy a house. And as the money is lent to Ben, so Ben appears on the bank's balance sheet as an asset. If we revisit the balance sheet of Nationwide, we can see the largest number in the assets relates to the loans and advances to customers, such as Ben. Incidentally, you will notice the second biggest number is debt securities in issue. This number is made up of low-risk securities, such as government bonds, that the bank holds in case Arthur wants to withdraw extra cash. This is a bit like the change you carry in your pocket to meet short-term expenditure needs. It, in effect, it ensures the bank's liquidity. The bank will pay Arthur, for example, 3% to borrow money from him, and will charge Ben, for example, 6% to borrow money from the bank. This gives rise to the 363 rule, where a bank will borrow money at 3%, will lend money at 6%, and at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, once it has lent out all of the money that it has borrowed, the employees can all go and play golf. If we look at the income statement of Nationwide, we can see the profitability of this business. Customers like Ben are paying a total of 5.4 billion in interest. Depositors like Arthur are being paid 3.7 billion in interest. The bank is making a profit called net interest income, which is a bit like gross profit, of 1.7 billion pounds. The bank can also borrow additional funds to lend out by issuing bonds. As the money is lent to the bank, then, just like Arthur, these amounts will appear on the balance sheet as a liability. If we return to the balance sheet of Nationwide, we can see that the second biggest liability is debt securities in issue, in effect the money that the bank owes to the bondholders. The bank, and we shall call them Bank 1, can also borrow money from another bank, Let's call them Bank 2. 
again as the money is transferred from bank 2 to bank 1, so bank 2 will appear as a liability on the balance sheet of bank 1. But now this poses a problem, because bank 1 has lent the money to Ben on a long-term basis, a typical mortgage being 25 years. In order to obtain matched funding, the bank has issued long-term bonds. The bank can also consider Arthur's deposit as long-term. Now I know that Arthur can withdraw his money whenever he wants, but statistically not all depositors will withdraw all their money at the same time. So the bank can treat this money as long-term. Under fractional reserving rules, the bank must put some of this deposit aside to meet short-term cash requirements. The rest is lent out. But the bank from Bank 2 is short-term. Bank 2 will lend to Bank 1 at an interest rate which is called LIBOR. And LIBOR stands for the London Interbank Offer Rate. This is the rate at which banks borrow and lend to each other. As banks are considered very low risk, this rate typically will be just above the base rate and is thus a cheap source of funding for Bank 1. So Bank 1 has lent the money on a long-term basis and has borrowed the money from Arthur on a long-term basis. This is matched funding and is good. The bonds issued to provide additional finance to Bank 1 are also long-term and again this is matched funding and is also good. But the loan from Bank 2 creates a mismatch for Bank 1 as, as it is now borrowing funds for example for 3 months and lending them out for 25 years. This does not pose a problem if the amount borrowed from Bank 2 is a small proportion of the total amount lent out. But if it is a significant element of the amount lent on a long-term basis, then Bank 1 becomes very dependent on its ability to refinance the short-term loan with Bank 2. If Bank 2 hears rumours that Ben is now struggling to repay his loan to Bank 1, then Bank 2 may decide not to allow Bank 1 to roll over or refinance its loan. As Bank 1 does not have the money, it cannot pay Bank 2. Remember, Bank 1 may well be solvent, but in this case it is illiquid. If Arthur gets wind of the fact that Bank 1 does not have enough cash, then he may decide to withdraw his deposit, turning his long-term loan into a short-term loan. If enough people do this, we get a run on the bank and the bank goes bust. Thus we see that the financial system is based on faith. If you lose faith in that system, then its failure becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So far we've looked at commercial banking. Let us now turn our attention to investment banking. There used to be a separation between commercial banks and investment banks. Back in the 1920s, commercial banks were allowed to use depositors' money to buy shares as well as to make loans. This was all well and good when share prices were rising, as they were in the 1920s. But in 1929, in the Wall Street crash, share prices plummeted. This meant that banks were unable to repay their depositors, resulting in a run on the banks causing the banks to go bust and plunging the USA into the Great Depression. And the rest, as they say, is history. In order to prevent this happening again, the Glass-Degal Act was introduced in the early 1930s. This act separated commercial banks from investment banks, effectively saying that banks could either take depositors' money and use that money to make loans, or they can assist their clients in accessing the debt and equity capital markets, but not both. This is the metaphorical equivalent of finding a horse that is bolted from the stable, leading it back to the stable and putting a big shiny bolt on the stable door. Approximately 70 years later, somebody asks, where's the horse? In the stable. Ah, in that case, we don't need the big shiny bolt anymore. You might question the logic of this argument, but in 1999, after 70 years of relative financial calm, the Glass-Degal Act was repealed. This allowed large commercial banks, such as Chase Manhattan, the largest commercial bank in the USA at the time, to merge with J.P. Morgan, a major investment bank, 
to create JP Morgan Chase & Co. One of the reasons for this merger was that the separation of activities of commercial banks and investment banks was becoming increasingly blurred. Commercial banks were advising their clients on investment banking issues, and investment banks wanted access to the strength of the balance sheets of the commercial banks. One example of this is securitization. The investment bank sees all of the loans sitting on the balance sheet of the commercial bank and asks the commercial bank if they can buy the loan book. The commercial bank agrees. The investment bank then sets up an SPV, which is a special purpose vehicle, in effect a shell company. This company is often set up in an offshore jurisdiction, away from the prying eyes of the regulators. The investment bank sells the loan book to the SPV, thus removing the loans from the balance sheet of the investment bank. The SPV then uses these loans to issue bonds. These bonds are ABS, or asset-backed securities. In this case, they are RMBS, which is a retail mortgage-backed security, but they could also be a CMBS, or commercially mortgage-backed security. The bondholder buys the bonds from the SPV. The SPV returns the money to the investment bank, and the investment bank gives the money back to the commercial bank. What does the commercial bank do with all that money? Of course, it lends it to Charlie, who uses the money to buy a house. Now, what is interesting here is that we can see how the fundamental model has now changed. For as in the past, commercial banks were concerned with attracting money into the bank, and the more money they attracted in, the more money they could lend out, they are now more, fo more focused on lending money out. Because the more money they lend, the more money they can securitize. Their operations therefore shifted to lending money out rather than attracting deposits in. Once commercial banks have lent money to everybody who can afford a mortgage, to whom are they now going to lend? The answer, of course, is people who cannot afford a mortgage. People like ninjas, which stands for no income, no job or assets, subprime and alt A. Now, if you're asking yourself why it is a good idea to lend pe money to people who cannot afford it, and as an example, a gentleman in California who earned $14,000 a year was able to borrow enough money to purchase a $750,000 house, then that would be a fair question. Step forward, the investment bankers. The investment bankers took a loan book, all the loans to Charlie and similar people, and decided that they would like to separate them into different elements or tranches, based on their likelihood of repaying the loan. Those at the bottom were bad, as they were very unlikely to repay their loans. Note at this point, we don't know which people from the loan book are bad, just that statistically some of them will default. The next level is known as OK. These are people who may default but may not. And the final level is known as good. These are the people who are very unlikely to default. We have now tranched the loan book. We can add this loan book, perhaps containing loans from California, to other loan books, perhaps from Tennessee and Michigan. The loans that are classified as bad, no one will buy, so the investment banks can park these loans on its balance sheets. And the loans are high risk, so the bank can pay itself a high rate of interest in compensation. The loans that are classified as good will be used to back the bond that is issued by the SPV. But what about the loans that are classified as OK? Well, the argument goes that whatever happens in Michigan to cause the OKs to default will not happen at the same time in Tennessee and California. We can therefore split this part into three more tranches, once again categorised as good, OK and bad. The good we can use to back the SPV. But look what we've done. We've created a group of loans that were originally classified as OK and have created loans classified as good 
out of them. This structure is known as a CDO, or Collateralized Debt Obligation. If I do this enough times, then this whole process is going to get very complicated indeed, and that is before we start introducing synthetic CDOs, which are derivative versions of CDOs that they mirror. If you want to buy a bond issued by a company, such as BP, you can very easily obtain the annual report and accounts of BP and assess the risk of BP being unable to make the interest or capital repayments on that bond. If you want to buy this bond that has been issued by the SPV, you probably have no idea what it is backed by. So why would you buy such a bond? Well, the answer is that you wouldn't or shouldn't, unless you can get an independent body who understands the product to assess the riskiness of the investment for you. Step forward, the credit rating agencies, such as Standard & Poor's, Moody's and Fitch's. Who pays their fees? The investment banks. And if the credit rating agencies give the correct rating to these products, then the investment banks will give them many more products to rate, earning the agencies significant amounts in fees. Now don't forget, these products are incredibly complicated. So complicated, in fact, that the banks that created them hardly understood them. So trying to explain their complexity to the credit rating agencies would be a waste of time. So instead, the investment banks simplify the explanation. The bond is an asset-backed security, which means that as Charlie pays off his mortgage, so the bondholder will receive their income. If for any reason Charlie is unable to repay his mortgage, then Charlie's house will act as the security and the house can be sold to pay the bondholder. And the rule is that the value of Charlie's house will always go up. Now, if you're thinking that this is not necessarily the case, I could show you a graph that demonstrates that house prices have increased every single year between 1900 and 2007, with the exception of 1991. OK, so not quite every single year. So what about 1991? What, ha what if that happens again? No problem, say the investment bankers. They have purchased insurance. Not from any old insurance company. They've purchased insurance from AIG, the world's largest insurance company. The credit rating agencies have given AIG a double A rating which means that it was pretty much risk-free. Reviewing this argument, it is clear that the bondholder is almost certainly going to get their money back, so the credit rating agencies were able to justify giving it a triple A rating, meaning that it is effectively a risk-free investment. AIG sold $440 billion of credit default swaps, a form of insurance, on these products. Now, an insurance company like AIG makes its money in two places. The first is ensuring that the premiums that it collects in exceed the claims that it pays out and the costs of running the business. This is known as the technical or underwriting result. But insurance company also makes profit by taking the premium when it is paid in and investing it. And as the investments grow, so it makes a return before paying out the claims. This is known as the non-technical result. The insurance company does not invest in high-risk securities such as shares, as these are too volatile, so it invests in bonds. Again, it does not want to invest in high-risk or junk bonds, only those with a AAA rating. Thus, the insurance companies were investing in the very products that they were rating. So when Charlie and all of the others like him default on their loans, which was obviously going to happen, then all of the loans classified as bad do in fact go bad and default. In fact, most of the OKs also go bad and default. And as all of the houses are now being sold due to foreclosure, house prices are no longer going up, but start to go down. And so the value of the bonds start to go down, which is a problem for the insurance companies, because just as their liabilities are going up, there are more claims because the house prices are falling, so the assets on their balance sheets are going down. Meanwhile, the bad loans sitting on the bank's balance sheets of the banks are sparkling concerns in the financial markets, 
as banks become more nervous of hidden losses sitting on each other's balance sheets, so they stop lending to each other. And one thing that a bank needs to survive is cash. And so, on the 15th of September 2008, Lehman Brothers finally went bust. And on the very next day, on the 16th of September 2008, AIG also went bust. Lehman was allowed to fail, the argument being that it was a pure play investment bank, so retail depositors would not lose their savings, and the Federal Reserve had to send a clear message to the market that no bank was too big to fail. AIG, on the other hand, was bailed out. The argument here was that it was an insurance company and its demise would have had a catastrophic impact on the economy at large. For example, it is estimated that if AIG had gone bust, 90% of the world's aircraft would not have taken off the following day. Because if you run an airline, you are not going to fly without adequate insurance cover. And so that, in a nutshell, is what securitization is, and that is how securitization contributed to the financial crisis of 2007-2008.